All right, hi students. Uh, welcome back to the section lecture for this week, lecture 6.2, which is all about ionic nomenclature. Uh, so in the last lecture, we talked about the different types of bonding, uh, uh, covalent or molecular types of bonds and ionic bonding. And uh, we talked about how to name binary covalent compounds or molecular compounds. So that was uh, lecture 6.1. And now we're going to go down this route for lecture 6.2 and we'll, and we'll uh, continue in lecture 6.3. Uh, so naming ionic compounds is a little bit more difficult and a little bit more involved. You'll need to do lots of practice here. Uh, it takes lots of practice to get good at this. Uh, don't give up. I do have an infinite practice for ionic nomenclature online that I'll show you a little bit later that includes all of the ions that uh, uh, that we've done so if you find that you have practice and practice with all the homeworks and everything but it's coming to the exam and you and you still need more practice uh, you can practice infinite online on my website which I'll show you uh, at the end of our lectures at the end of lecture 6.3 <clears throat> so uh, first of all we're going to have an introduction to Lewis dot structures so for ions these Lewis dots uh, tend to be a nice way of explaining to you what's going on with the electrons. So in the last lecture we used Bohr models uh, to show this, but uh, those are big and kind of clumsy. So what we can do is use Lewis dot structures uh, and use those to predict the, the structures and the properties. Uh, and as we go forward we'll do Lewis dot structures later for covalent compounds as well in, in future weeks. So. Uh, for Lewis dot structures, uh, the way that you write them is you put the symbol of the element and then you put dots next to it that represent the number of um, valence electrons that an atom has. So let's take a quick look at the periodic table here. Our periodic table is right here. So if we're looking at our periodic table, um, oops, here and we have our hydrogen. Okay, hydrogen is right here. Uh, it's in group one and it has one valence electron. Um, calcium, and so there's one dot there. Calcium is in group two right here, 2A, and this is the groups we're referring to, the ones with the A's. Uh, and calcium is in there, that indicates that it has two valence electrons. Now, for the oxygen, oxygen is in group 6A, so we're numbering the groups like this, one, two and then we skip this jump here and we go three four five six seven eight and the the elements in group six have six valence electrons and we discovered that back when we were writing electron structures uh, before the exam and and writing Bohr diagrams and so now we're just going to skip that you probably want to note on your periodic table the group number is the number of valence electrons not a bad note to have somewhere uh, so you know you can even renumber these groups if you want. I like I said I call these uh, I call this group group one group uh, I call this group one group two group three four five six seven and eight like that. That's the way I call them, and so it's consistent with these Roman numerals here. And this is a Roman numeral for three. Roman numeral for four is IV. For for five is V. For six is VI, for seven is VII, and for eight is VIII. And you'll want to know those Roman numerals too, or at least up to like five or six, uh, because we will be using Roman numerals for another purpose later. But that's the way I'm going to call these groups group one, two, and then skip over here three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And uh, very important is the group number equals the number of valence electrons and these are going to be really important because these are the electrons uh, involved in the bonding hmm, my writing got messed up for a second there but electrons hmm it keeps wanting to move my writing but you get the idea so make sure that you know that uh, you want to know that by heart uh, <clears throat> So if we have potassium, for example, potassium is in group one, it has one uh, valence electron. So the number of valence electron is the number of dots here. So potassium has one dot for one valence electron. Each element has a number of valence electrons that is equal to the group number, as I just described on the periodic table. 
Nice thing to have as a note on your periodic table too, so you don't forget. You should also understand why, uh, based on what we learned uh, right before the exam. Sulfur is in group six of the periodic table. If we go back, we see sulfur right here is in group six. So you find the group number from the periodic table. It's the, the number at the top uh, that we wrote there. It's the, the number next to the A again. Uh, and then you put enough dots to equal that. So it's group six, so six dots, six valence electrons. And we care about the valence electrons because these are the ones that are involved in the bonding. As we saw with the covalent bonding, and we'll see with the ionic bonding, most every element wants to get eight valence electrons somehow around it, with the exception of hydrogen, which is good with only two. <clears throat> so, uh, now when, when an ionic compound is being formed, we saw in the last lecture that it is formed when the metal gives up all of its valence electrons, and the nonmetal gets enough to have a full shell, which will be eight for every atom except for hydrogen, which is two. So let's think about calcium sulfide. So calcium is in group two. It's right here, group two. So it has two valence electrons. So if we want to represent calcium, we would represent calcium with uh, calcium here with two dots, okay, calcium. Two dots for two valence electrons. Okay. And it's going to lose them to make a calcium positive two ion. The metal is the one that loses the electrons. The non-metal in calcium sulfide here is going to be sulfur. So if we have sulfur, it's going to start with six valence electrons. And make sure to make your dots, if you're, if you're writing dots, make them, you know, Pretty nice, and a, a, a general policy is you don't want more than two dots on any one side. It doesn't matter exactly how you put the dots as long as you have six and you have no more than two on any one side in this case. So now what happens in this process is the calcium, remember that the metal loses its electrons, so the calcium is going to lose its electrons. It's going to give them to sulfur, and it's going to give its two to sulfur, and then at that point sulfur is going to have a full shell with eight valence electrons. The calcium will also have a full shell too because it emptied its outer shell. So there's gonna be a full shell underneath that. And so the result at the end is that we end up with a calcium ion. That calcium ion will now be positive two. It's positive two because it has two more protons than it has electrons now because it lost two electrons. And the sulfide, now it's going to be sulfide, it's going to have eight electrons all together with the extra two it got. And so since it has two extra electrons that it didn't have before, it will have two more electrons than it has protons. So it will have a negative two charge, which we write as two minus or minus two, either one is okay. Um, and so this is what happens with calcium and sulfur. We get calcium sulfide, which in Lewis structure drawings looks like this. For the negative ion, we put a bracket around the dots to separate the dots from the charge. This just makes it look a little cleaner. You don't need that for the positive ion because it's given up its two valence electrons. So those are all gone now. So notice what happens here. Again, they each get full shells. The calcium gets the full shell underneath after its two valence electrons are gone, and the sulfur gets a full shell with eight electrons. Now, not all, not the formation of, of ionic compounds doesn't always go so neatly like that. For example, let's say we're making a ionic compound between potassium ions and nitride ions. Uh, and so this is going to be a compound called potassium nitride. Now potassium is in group one right here. So that means it will have one valence electron. So we would give uh, potassium a symbol that says K with one dot, right? If we're doing uh, dot Lewis dot structures. And it's going to lose that one valence electron and make a positive one ion when it does, because it now, once it loses that one electron, it will have one more proton than it has electrons. So it will have a positive one charge. Nitrogen is a nonmetal. It's in group five right here, 
group 5. And so it is going to start with five valence electrons. So if we're drawing the dot structure for nitrogen, it will look like this. Two, three, four, five. Okay, I put five dots around it. Five valence electrons. And so it has to gain three more to have eight. And so in the end, the, the nitride ion will end up being a negative three charge. <coughs> So what this means is that one potassium will not have enough electrons to satisfy the, the nitrogen. It wants to have three more. So let's write this. So let's say we have a potassium and it has its one valence electron. And then we have a nitride here and it has its five, or sorry, a nitrogen atom to start. It has its five. So one potassium atom gives its electron here to the nitrogen and now the nitrogen has six valence electrons but the nitrogen wants to have eight they all want a full shell so this nitrogen will continue to collect electrons from wherever it can now when a chemical reaction is happening it's almost never the case i mean it's really impossible that we could just have two atoms involved in this reaction what this means is there must be other potassium atoms close by. So even though one, each one potassium can only give one electron, another potassium atom can come and give another electron to the same nitrogen atom. And so at this point, the nitrogen atom now has seven electrons all around it. Finally, there can be, there's definitely, you know, lots and lots of atoms. There's jillions of them. So another potassium ion or atom will come around before long and give its one valence electron to <clears throat> the nitrogen. And now the nitrogen has a full eight valence electrons. So it's not going to uh, collect any more. But the result is that we're going to get not just one potassium ion, we're gonna get three potassium plus one ions to make one nitride ion. And so that's the result we see here. When this potassium loses its one electron, it makes a potassium plus one ion because now it has one less electron. So it has one more proton than it has electrons. So it has a positive one charge. And we get three of these, but only one nitride ion, okay? Uh, and so uh, that nitride ion is negative three in charge because it gained three extra electrons and electrons have a negative charge. So it has three extra negative charges. Ultimately, when we write the formula for the compound, the formula from the compound is gonna be K3N. It will need three potassium ions for one nitride ion. But right now I'm, I'm not talking about the, the formulas just yet. I'm explaining to you how these get made by the movement of these electrons. Now it can get even more complex. Let's take aluminum oxide as an example. So this involves aluminum atoms to begin with. So aluminum is in group three right here, aluminum in group three. So it starts with three valence electrons. So if we're writing the dot structure for aluminum, it would look like this, Al, and it would have three dots, three dots to it. And that's its three valence electrons. When it loses them, it will have three less negative charges. So it will have three more positive charges and negative charges. It will have a positive three ion, uh, charge. Finally, uh, oxygen is group six. Oxygen is group six, okay. And so it will have six valence electrons. So the oxygen uh, Lewis structure for the atom will look like this. And each oxygen will want to gain two more electrons to make a negative two charge. So that means we have to have uh, two, we're gonna end up having two aluminums. And let me show you why. So, let me see, here, let me take, okay. So let's say, We've got one aluminum here, and it's got its three electrons, right? And we have an oxygen with its six. So this aluminum can begin to give its electrons to oxygen, 
boom right there like that and boom and it gives two of them but it still has one left over so i'm going to give this one a different color i'm going to make it black just to show that it's going to go to a different atom here okay but remember that we have plenty of atoms around we don't just have one aluminum atom and one oxygen atom we have as many as need to there need to be in order to get everyone get the right number of electrons so another oxygen atom comes around which also wants two additional electrons and this aluminum has one electron to give so it gives it right there well <clears throat> Uh, so that was the, the black one there. So I'm just going to color over it now. So the thing is that this aluminum is happy now. It has gotten rid of its three, but this oxygen needs one more. But that's okay. There's not just one aluminum atom around. There are jillions of them. So this aluminum atom here can give one of its electrons to this oxygen. But now this oxygen is full. It has a full eight. But that's okay, there's lots of oxygens around. There's another one that will float by quite soon. And so now this aluminum can give its two last electrons. And at this point, everybody has an arrangement that is, is good and, and stable. Uh, the aluminum has gotten its full shell underneath by getting rid of all three of its valence electrons. Both of these did. And each oxygen was able to get two extra electrons to get its full eight in its shell. And so the result is at that point, it took two aluminums to give six electrons to three oxygens, which took six electrons. And in the end, we have, we get two aluminum ions that are both positive three in charge because they each lost three electrons. And we get three oxide ions which are each negative two because they each gained two electrons now one thing to note is for four compounds like this in the end the charges of all the ions have to add up to zero so we we have two aluminums each are positive three so we have three plus three here then we have three oxides which are negative two so we add negative two three times and they all add up to zero this is because the electrons are, are not, you know, disappearing. They're going from one place to another. So overall, the charge is neutral. And that's why when we finally write the formula for aluminum oxide, it's going to look like this. Al2, two aluminums. That's these two right here. O3. And you'll see that when we write the formulas as well, something that's really important is when we write the formulas, they're not going to have any charges in them. And this is because once all the ions come together like this their charges cancel each other out to zero so the the aluminum oxide which is the compound made from these ions overall will have zero charge so now that we've used these lewis dot structures to show how these compounds are made let's talk about how we can write the names names like aluminum oxide and the formulas like al2o3 Uh, just one more thing about these Lewis structures before I move on to that. Uh, again, what you have noticed is that the metal ion will have no dots left. It will have a positive charge. The non-metal ion will have its eight electrons. We will separate those dots from the charge by a bracket and put the negative one charge. I don't usually have you draw Lewis dot structures for ionic compounds. I do for covalent compounds. But I do use the Lewis dot structures to explain how the electrons are moving as we just did here. So did you notice something here? Is that all the group one elements start with one valence electron. So they all make positive one ions. So I like to, on my periodic table, remind myself that while these all don't always make ions, but when they do, these make positive one ions. Okay. So these are as ions. If they're an atom, of course, they don't have a charge. But the ions here are always positive one from this group because they have one valence electron to lose. And when they lose it, they, they have one more proton than they have electrons. Group two metals 
like calcium and magnesium, start with two valence electrons. And then when they lose both those electrons, then they have two more protons and electrons. They have positive two charge. So when these don't always make ions, but when they do, they make positive two ions. Okay. And likewise, for group three, like aluminum, they start with three valence electrons. And like we saw in the last example, if they lose all three, they make a positive three ion. So you can just note to yourself that these guys, these metals always make positive three ions. So remember, metals make positive ions. So now we've passed through the whole metal part here. There are some metals down here that we'll talk about later. Uh, but now we're going to focus on nonmetals. So for nonmetals, the pattern is like this. The group seven elements start with seven valence electrons. They all need one more to get a full shell, to get eight. So they tend to gain one electron and make ions with negative one charges. Again, they don't always make ions, but when they do, they make negative one ions. Just like the most interesting man in the universe doesn't always drink beer, when, but when he does, he drinks Dos Equis, right? These are the most interesting ions in the universe, and they don't always, they aren't always ions, but when they are, these ones are always negative one here, because they need one more to have eight. Now for group six, uh, ions like oxide ion, sulfide ion, so forth, uh, these in group six, they need two more electrons to have eight, because they start with six valence electrons. So these always make negative two charges. It's a good idea to have a negative two note above this group when they make ions. And group five elements, they start with five, they need three more to have eight. So nitride, phosphide, these are generally negative three ions. And then these guys, uh, carbon and silicon, uh, they don't really make ions most of the time. We're not gonna talk about them. They could, but it's very exotic. Uh, it's because they'd have to either gain or lose four electrons and that just takes too much energy for that to happen. So now in the previous lecture, we talked about naming binary covalent compounds. Now we're gonna talk about naming binary ionic compounds. So when you name the binary ionic compound, you always name the metal first, and then you name the nonmetal and you use an eyed ending like oxide, okay? Uh, this is because that's what the name of the ion is. Just to give you an indication here, this is, O is oxygen atom, okay? O2, as we saw earlier, this is oxygen molecule or oxygen gas. And these are neutral. But oxygen with a negative two charge is oxide ion. Okay. Uh, and so we're name when we name the non-metal, we're actually naming the ion. So we're naming the metal ion first and then the non-metal ion second. And if it's a non-metal ion with just one atom, its name always ends with "-ide." And so that's why for binary ionic compounds, we always end the name with "-ide." Never ever use the prefixes, okay? Uh, prefixes are only for covalent compounds. Why? Because covalent compounds don't have charges. So we can't use the charges to figure out how many of each atom there can be. Uh, with with co covalent compounds, there could be any number of atoms because there are no ions. So they just share electrons in, in various different ways. But with ionic compounds, there always has to be the same amount of positive charge as there is negative charge. The charges have to add up to zero. So we can always use the charge to figure out how many of each ion there should be. So we never need prefixes to stay how many, and you should never use pre prefixes like di or tri when you're naming ionic compounds. And you'll know you're naming ionic compounds because there'll be metals and nonmetals. In covalent compounds, there are only nonmetal atoms. So going formula to name, let's describe how to do that. Let's say we have something like this. 
sodium chloride, okay? So uh, again, we write the name of the, the metal, sodium. And then we write the name of the nonmetal and put an I at the end. Now instead of chlorine, we say chloride. That's it. We're done. And this is because, the reason why we name it this way is because sodium chloride is made out of sodium ions. So this is called sodium ion. And Cl minus, this is called chloride ion. So the nonmetal ions have names that end with ide. So really when we're naming ionic compounds, we're just writing the name of the positive ion. This is called, so we're writing this sodium. That's the name of the positive ion. Then we're writing the name of the negative ion, chloride. And that's the way it's going to go for every ionic compound. Uh, so chloride, the ide ending is for uh, ions, negative ions that have only one atom. Later, we're going to talk about ions that, that are polyatomic. They have more than one atom, and their names will end differently a lot of the times. What about this one? Beryllium. So we say the name of the metal. Beryllium. Then we say the non name of the nonmetal, but we end with ide. Bromide. That's it. That's all we do. Simple enough for these binary covalents. Note that there's no prefixes. We don't say dibromide. It's because this is ionic. How can we tell? Beryllium's a metal. So when you're naming these, you should always think, are these ionic or covalent, right? I know these ones are ionic because there's a metal here. Sodium's a metal. See? Sodium's on the left side of the periodic table. Whoops. It's a metal right here. Okay. I know this is ionic because beryllium's a metal. Covalent compounds don't have metals in them. They have only nonmetals. So always check if it's ionic or covalent because there's two different ways to name these. I taught you covalent last time. Covalent use prefixes. This time I'm teaching ionic, no prefixes. This one, aluminum, aluminum. And then sulfide. Okay, that's it. You don't have to do dyes or tries. You shouldn't. If you do, if you said dialuminum trisulfide, no, that's wrong. It's aluminum sulfide. We already know there's got to be two aluminums for three sulfides because that's the only way to make the charges cancel out. Uh, just just to show you here, if we have we have two aluminums, so we look. Oh, aluminum. Oh, what would be the charge on aluminum ion? I see there are two of them here. So I'm going to write two. And what's the charge? Oh, aluminum is group three. Aluminum, group three. So aluminum right here. So the charges on those must be positive three. And then sulfide. Oh, sulfur, group six, negative two charges. And I've got three of them, three of them right here. So I'd write three sulfides each with negative two charge and if i look at my charges i've got six positives six negatives that's why there uh that's why we know there has to be two aluminums with three sulfides because the charges have to add up to zero and again the way the naming works is we name the positive ion so the alumina this one's called an aluminum ion. And this one is called a sulfide ion. Monatomic ions, atoms, ions that are composed of one atom here, sulfur, they just take the name of that, that atom and put an ide at the end. So that's why the name is aluminum sulfide, because it has an aluminum ion for its positive ion and a sulfide ion for its negative ion. This is called sulfide ion. This is called aluminum ion. So aluminum sulfide. K2O. First we should check, ionic or covalent? We have to know if potassium is a metal. Potassium is a metal. It is ionic. We'll name it the ionic way. So we just say potassium. And then we put ox and end with ide. Potassium oxide. That's it. 
So formula to name, not too tough. What about this one? Magnesium, iodide. Same thing there. So not too tough going formula to name. Going name to formula is a bit harder because when you go formula to name, within the formula they're already telling you how many of each type of ion that you should have. But, and notice if, one, if there's a one, the one isn't written. But if you're going name to formula, it's harder because you have to figure out how many of each ion you should have. So let's say we're talking about lithium sulfide. How do you do this one? Okay, well, you, you look, you say, okay, is this ionic or covalent? Lithium, is that a metal? If lithium's a metal, this is ionic. Lithium is a metal. Okay, so then it means it's made out of ions. Let's figure out what ions. Well, lithium is in group one, so it is making positive one ions. And sulfide is, is uh, sulfur is from group six, and so it has negative two ions. Now, as I said, when, when these chemical reactions are happening, there's never just one atom or one ion around. There's lots and lots. Uh, you just, what you can do is you can add as many of each of these as you want. You just can't change the charge. Sulfide is always negative two. Lithium is always positive one. But before long, there'll be another lithium coming around. And if we have two lithiums, that gives us two positive charges total. And that goes with our two negative charges. So that way I can figure out that when I write my formula, it should be Li2, two lithiums, and then S, one sulfide. And so the hard part about going name to formula is you have to figure out and you can use this method I just did. Uh, you have to figure out how many of each ion there should be. So what you do is you look up the charge of each ion, then you write them out like this and write as many of each as you need to cancel the charges. Be careful, you don't want to, you don't want to write, for example, you don't want to keep going and write uh, Li4S2, because even though that would cancel the charges, that's, that number's too high. You want the lowest numbers you can get. And so Li2S is appropriate here. What about calcium fluoride? Well, first we check, is this ionic or covalent? Okay, calcium. Uh, ion, uh, calcium is a metal, so this must be ionic. So I check, what's the charge for a calcium ion? Positive two. So calcium ions are positive two. Then I go and check for fluoride ions. Well, fluoride ions, fluorine is in group one. I know it's a monatomic ion, whoops, one atom because it ends with ide. So I can go straight to the periodic table and see that a fluoride ion is negative one in charge. And at that point, I have to figure out what do I need more of? Do I need positive charges or do I need negative charges? I need more negative charges. So I write one more fluoride. Notice I cannot change the charge but I can write as many of these as I need. And that gives me two negative charges to cancel with my two positives. So I can write the formula now. One calcium, two fluorines, CaF2. Another thing to note, this is your answer. And your answer is a neutral ionic compound. Okay, neutral ionic compound. There should be no charge, Whoops. What happened? Okay. No charges in your answer. This is really important. If you're writing charges in your answer, it's wrong. Okay. Once these ions come together and stick together in ionic bond, their cancel their charges cancel. Two positives cancels with two negatives zero charge okay no charge for the compound the individual ions have charges but the compound does not that's really important notice how i write no charges in the compound this is your work you can do that on scrap paper anywhere but when you write your answer it's got no charges so here's a few more examples of name to formula sodium fluoride 
Okay, first of all, sodium metal, yes, right here. And sodium is positive one. So Na plus. Fluoride, the ide tells me that this is monatomic, one atom. That means I can go to the periodic table and find what would be the charge for that ion. Negative one. So F is negative one. So at this point, I already have one positive charge to go with my one negative charge. So I, I'm already good. So I write for my answer, NAF. Notice this is my answer. This is my work, okay? No charges in my answer. Calcium bromide. Again, ionic? Well, calcium is a metal, so it's ionic. Uh, calcium ions have a positive two charge. So I can write my calcium ions. Again, I'm gonna continue with this. Over here's my work, over here's my answer. My work does not go in the answer line, okay? Um, so I have calcium, its charge is positive two. And since this is bromide at the end, that tells me that this is a monatomic ion, one atom. So I can go to the periodic table and figure out the charge. Bromine is here. So a bromide ion must have a negative one charge. So I write Br minus. Then I write enough of each so that my charges will cancel. What do I need more of, positive or negative? Well, I have two positives, I only have one negative. I need another negative, so I write another bromide. Don't change a charge, it can only be negative one, but you can have more than one. So that gives me two negatives to go with my two positives. And so now I can write my answer. This is one calcium and two, see how we have two bromides? So I write Br2, like that. Next, beryllium nitride. Again, ask myself, ionic or covalent? Well, let's check, is beryllium a metal? Beryllium is a metal, it's on the left side here. It's in group two, so beryllium ions have a positive two charge. I'm gonna write this one up here, Be2 plus. Nitride. Okay, the ide again tells me this is monatomic. That means I can go to the periodic table and look for the nitrogen. And it's in group three, which tells me the ion will have a negative three charge. So a nitride ion is this. That's a nitride ion. Now, <clears throat> here um, we, we have three negatives, but only two positives. And we can't change a charge. What we can do is we can add another beryllium. That's fine. But that gives us two and two, four positive charges, but only three negative charges. And we can't change a charge, but what we can do is we can add as many nitrides as we need. So that gives us another nitride. Now we have six total negative charges, but only four positive charges. So we need one more beryllium. And that gives us six positive charges, six negative charges. Okay, now we, we've canceled the charges, which is what we always have to do. So now we can write our formula here. It's gonna have three beryllium's. We can see three of them here. So we say Be3 and two nitrides, one, two. So we put N2. And one more example, magnesium oxide. So again, we should check, is this ionic or covalent? We check by looking at, is magnesium a metal? Yes, it is. Okay, magnesium is a metal. So the magnesium here is going to be, uh, let's look for the charge. Magnesium, positive two charge. So, all right. And then oxide, the ide tells us that this is monatomic, so that means we can go to the periodic table to figure out the charge. Oxygen is in group six, so it will make a negative two charge for the oxide ion. And so now we already have two positives to go with our two negatives, so we write the formula MgO. Important, now a lot of people start to see this, they start to see a pattern, okay? 
I'm going to show you the pattern. It, uh, it's often called the crisscross. So they see right here BE3 and 2. And they notice a pattern. They say, if I look at this number here, it is the same as this one here. And if I look at this number here, it is the same as this one here. Oh, can I just do that every time? And the answer is no, you can't. Uh, the reason is because you can't do that here. The, the right answer is MGO, it's not MG202. So if you're going to try to do this crisscrossing, I get it, okay? I get it. I get why you're trying it. But be careful, okay? I don't recommend the crisscrossing because you get into situations where you crisscross and then you forget that your numbers are not the smallest that they could be. So I don't re recommend the crisscross method. Does it work sometimes? Yes. But it sometimes gets my students into trouble. So I mention it because I know some people are going to do it, uh, but I, I don't recommend it and I don't teach it either. Okay, finally, um, binary ionic compounds with variable charged metals. Okay, so when we're naming uh, some of these metal uh, metals in ionic compounds can actually have more than one possible charge. In fact, most of them can. These are called variable charged metals. Uh, and so we have to identify if we have a variable charged metal in our ionic compound because if we do, it's not enough to say that we have that metal ion. We also have to indicate what the charge is in this particular compound. So here, for example, iron 3 means that the iron ion that's in here has a positive 3 charge. That's what the Roman numeral 3 means. And then the negative ion is a chloride, which is this. And so uh, we, we will have to indicate the, the charge of the ion. So that's an extra thing. So now if the compound is ionic, we also have to check, is the metal a fixed charge metal or a variable charge metal? Because if it's a variable charge metal, we're going to have to add this little part where we, where we tell what the charge is using Roman numerals. Uh, don't worry about Lewis dots. I'm not going to do any Lewis dot examples with these because they don't really make sense in that case. So what are the variable charge metals? It's actually easier to say what aren't the variable charge metals. So all the metals that aren't in group one or group two or group three or zinc or silver or cadmium. How the heck are you going to remember that? I'm going to show you how and how you can make a, a uh, make a note on your periodic table to remind you. An example of a variable charge metal is iron. So iron is very common to be positive two ion. It can also be positive three iron. And so, uh, uh, so and it's going to it's going to change what the chemical is and all of the properties depending on what ion happens to be in in a uh, in the chemical. So for example, FeO is called iron 2 oxide. It is composed so FeO has a iron 2 plus ion and a oxide 2 minus ion. And so that's why it's called iron 2 oxide. It's called iron 2 oxide because the iron has a positive 2 charge. However, this compound here, Fe2O3, this happens to have two ions that are each positive three, and it has three oxides, which are each negative two. So it's neutral because it has six negatives to go with its six positives. But in iron three oxide, which is rust actually, the iron ions are all positive three, and so that's why it's called iron three oxide. So remember that the, the Roman numeral here corresponds to the charge of the ion, okay? It does not correspond to how many are written. Notice that this is not iron two oxide here. This is iron three oxide, the Fe2O, because it has irons with a positive three charge, okay? FeO is iron two oxide, not because there's a two down here, there isn't. It's because the iron has a positive two charge. So for the fixed charge metals, you're, you're going to want to quickly identify on your, using your periodic table what is a fixed charge metal and what is a variable charge metal.
Well, for some of these, you've already got notes of it on your periodic table if you've been making the same notes that I have. So this is group one here, and we already made a note on our periodic table for group one right here that these are always positive one. So you don't need any special note for that. We already made a note for group two here that these are all positive two. So you don't need any special note for that either. We also made a note for the group three metals, aluminum, gallium, indium. Boron's not included because it's not a metal. Uh, these are all positive three, okay? Uh, the only ones that we haven't made a note for are these guys right here. So notice the shape like this triangle. So your fixed charge metals are the ones that are right in, in I'm going to use a thick marker here, that are right in here. So these are fixed charge, and you've already indicated their charge right here. And they're also right in here. So these ones you already know they're positive three, but what you should remember is that these guys are, uh, are positive two, and silver here is positive one when it's an ion. Of course, they're not always ions, uh, but every other Every other metal is variable charge. So that includes all of these metals here, all of these, and these, and this one. Okay, and then these are the semi metals here. All right, so all of these metals here, variable charged. So right in here, these are the variable charge, including tin, lead, all variable charge, okay? Whereas in the blue, it's fixed, whoops, it's fixed charge, fixed charge. So when you are naming an ionic compounds now you not only have to decide is it ionic because it has a metal in it but you also have to decide is the metal fixed charge or is it variable charge and you will use these types of notes on your periodic table probably not as messy as mine but uh, note where your fixed charge metals are if it's not a fixed charge metal it's a variable charge metal so these are the only fixed charge metal if it's not here it's variable charge so how are you going to name this so you name it like any uh, uh binary not covalent sorry binary ionic uh, but you leave a space for the roman numeral so we see cobalt oh cobalt is that a uh is that a variable charge metal? Let's go back to our periodic table. Cobalt is right here. Yep, it's in our red variable charge area. So it's going to need a Roman numeral uh, in it to before the name is done. So we're gonna have to calculate the charge on the metal. And there's a couple ways to do this. I'm gonna show you a visual way and an algebra way. So uh, here, let's do cobalt bromide. Okay, so basically the way it's gonna work is we're gonna use what we know about the negative charges to figure out the positive charge, okay? So let's say we've got the formula COBR2 and we were asked to write the name. Well, what we're gonna do is we're gonna write the cobalt, but we're going to put a question mark here for the charge because it's variable charge, so we don't know the charge. Then the other ion here is bromide. So for bromide, we do know the charge, because it's a monatomic negative ion. So we can go to the periodic table and we can find where it is. Oh, bromide is in group seven. So it will have a negative one charge. We also see from the formula here, there are two of them. So we're gonna write down two of them. Like this. So you write them out. And now we're going to calculate 
the, char the, the positive charge here. And we can do that either visually, like this, we route out the two bromides, add up the negative charges, boom, two negative charges. Now what this means is that since we know there are two negative charges, there must also be two positive charges. And what we do then is we distribute those two positive charges to all of our metal ions. Since there's only one cobalt, we know there's only one cobalt because there's no number written here. All those positive twos must be on the cobalt. So now we don't have to have a question mark here. We know the charge is positive two. Okay, so we have two ions. Now we have the cobalt, cobalt two plus. This ion is called cobalt two ion. Okay, it needs the two because the cobalt could be three or four, but it's not in this case, it's two. And then we have the Br minus, that's called the bromide ion because monatomic negative ions, negative ions with one atom like this, always end with ide. And so the name becomes cobalt two bromide. And that's the name of this. This is cobalt two bromide. Okay. Now there is another way that you could figure out the charge. You could say, okay, I've got one cobalt. So I'm going to call the charge CO here, and I'll have one times CO. And if I add that to the negative charges, there are two of them, and each bromide is negative one, that has to add to zero because the overall compound has to be neutral. Otherwise, it would go looking for more electrons, or they would, it would continue to react until it was. And so if I add two to both sides, I get cobalt is positive two. So if you like algebra, you can do it the algebra way, or if you like visual, you can do it the visual way. Okay, either way works. I like to teach in the visual way, and not all my students like to do algebra all the time, but I do show the algebra way. So what we saw here with the algebra is you'd have the number of metal ions times, times the charge, whatever that is, we'll call it X, plus the, the number of negative ions times their charge, they always add to zero. So you can solve for X as we saw algebraically and get the charge, or you could do it visually, like I showed you here. Uh, and in the formula, we'll give you how many of each. So you have to pay attention to the formula and you have to know what the negative charges are so you can figure out the positive charge. Here's another example. So let's say I'm given the formula Cu2S and I'm asked to get the, uh, the name of it. Well, I know it's going to, first I'm going to say, is this ionic or covalent? Okay, always you should ask that. Well, to know I should see is copper a metal. Copper is a metal. It's, it's over here on the metal side. Then, once I know it's a metal, I should ask myself, is it fixed charge or variable charge? Well, copper is in the variable charge area right here. So it's variable charge, which means that when we write the name, we're going to have to write copper something. And then we'll write, since this is a monatomic negative ion, we'll write sulfide. But we need the, the charge, so we're going to have to figure it out. So we look at the formula, and the formula tells us we have two coppers. Okay, we have two coppers. Cu. So I'm going to write down two coppers, and then I'm going to write a question mark for the charges, because I don't know what they are. But I know I have two, whatever the charge is. Then I've got sulfide. Sulf and so sulfur is in group six. It will have a negative two charge. And look here, sulfur group six negative two charge, two minus, then, I, and I can see I only have one, I only have one of those, only one, so I just wrote one, so two coppers, unknown charge, those two coppers, unknown charge, one sulfide, known charge, minus two, so I add up my negative charges, two negatives, then I say, I don't know my positive charges, but I do know they have to equal to my total negative charges. So my total positive charges must be two positive charges. 
And then what I do is I take them and I distribute them evenly between my coppers. So this copper gets one positive charge, and this other copper gets the other one, one positive charge. So since the coppers have positive one charge, this is copper one sulfide. Really important note. The copper one tells us that the charge of the copper is positive one. It does not tell us what number is there. The number should be two, but this name is copper one sulfide because the one tells us that the charge of the ion is positive one. And this is called the copper one ion, and this is called the sulfide ion. That's why the name is copper one sulfide. You always write the name of the positive ion, then the name of the negative ion. Likewise, you could figure this out algebraically. We have two coppers. The charge, we'll call it X, plus one sulfide with a negative two charge. Those have to add to zero. So X must be positive one. Two times one plus one times negative two adds up to zero. So it's copper one sulfide. Now going from name to formula, with variable charge metals is a, a bit easier in a way because when you go from name to formula, they tell you the name of the, uh, the, the charge of the ion. So for example here, nickel two tells us that the nickel must be positive two. And then to know what the charge on iodide is, I go to the periodic tables. Since it ends with iod, it's monatomic. And I look, oh, iodine's in group seven. So that monatomic iodide ion must be negative one. Then I need one more iodide so that I have two negatives to go with my two positives from the nickel. And finally, my formula is right here, NiI2. One nickel, two iodides. One more example, iron two nitride. Okay, again, iron two tells us not that there's two irons necessarily, it tells us that the iron is positive two. And that's a metal, so this is ionic. Then nitride, because the name ends with ide here, that tells me I have a monatomic negative ion. So I go over and look for nitrogen, and the monatomic uh, nitride ion has a charge of negative three. So it's N three minus. Now I've got to figure out how many I need to cancel my charges. I've got two positives and three negatives. I need more positive. So I write another iron two ion. That gives me two plus two, four positives, but only three negatives. So I need another nitride ion. Now that gives me six negatives. If I want to have six positives, I need one more iron two ion. That gives me six positives. So when I write my formula for iron two nitride, this is gonna be three irons, two nitrides. Notice the name of this is iron two nitride. The iron two, the two here, tells you that the charge on the iron is positive two. It does not, it does not tell you how many irons there should be. You have to figure that out by canceling the charge. So iron two means iron positive two, nitride is N three minus from group five. And if we add up the charges, we have three times positive two, which is positive six, plus two times negative three, which is negative six, and they add up to zero. That's three iron two ions and two nitride ions. So a couple more examples for you here. Cobalt two, bromide, okay? Obviously, this is ionic, cobalt's a metal, and the cobalt here has a positive two charge. The ide here tells us that this bromide ion is monatomic, so we can go to the periodic table to get its charge. Bromide is negative one, Br minus one. And again, this is our work. This does not appear on the answer line. Uh, we're gonna need one more bromide to to have our even charges. That gives us two negatives with our two positives here. And so finally we write our name. It's, uh, it's going to be CO, whoops, I 
I made that O too big. I'll make my C bigger. Be careful with the O. The big O means oxygen. So CO Br2. We don't want to have oxygen. We want cobalt. C little O. Okay. What about scandium 3 oxide? So scandium is right here. It's SC. All right. So I'll write this one up here. So SC and the 3 tells us that it's positive 3 charge. Then oxide, the ide tells us that the oxide ion is monatomic with oxygen. So oxygen is in group 6, so it makes a negative 2 ion. And now we got to figure out how many of each we need. We've got three positives, only two negatives, so we add another oxide. But now we've got four negatives and only three positives, so we add another scandium. Now we've got six positives, three and three, but only four negatives, so we add another oxide. And that gives us six negatives to go with our six positives. So when we finally write our formula, it's going to be SC2, two, two scandiums, three oxides, so O3. SC2, O3. Now what about going from formula to name? Again, this is a little trickier because we gotta look at this. First we ask, is it ionic or covalent? Well, it, it'll be ionic if manganese is a metal. Manganese is right here. It is a metal and it's variable charge. So we've got some work to do because we've got one manganese, but we don't know what the charge is. Oops, I forgot my end. We don't know the charges. We have to figure it out. We've got two sulfides. So we know this is monatomic, so we can go to the periodic table to find the charge. Sulfur is group six, so it makes sulfide ions with negative two charge. So we write the negative charges in. Then we add up the negative charges, four negatives, and we remind ourselves that However many negative charges there are, there must be the same amount of positive charges. So if there's four negative charges, that means there's four positive charges because the charges have to cancel. And we distribute these charges to all our manganese. Notice we only have one manganese. So all those four, positive four must all be on the one manganese. So this is positive four. So now we can write, finally write the name. Uh, so the name is going to be manganese 4, which is indicated as IV in Roman numerals. And then this is called the sulfide ion. So manganese 4 sulfide. And again, with ionic naming, the positive ion is always written first. It's called manganese 4 ion. So we start with manganese 4. Then you write the name of the negative ion after that, sulfide. Manganese 4, sulfide. Finally, one more. CD3, N2. Okay. So here we've got cadmium. And so we say, well, is this ionic or covalent? We have to know if cadmium is a metal. Cadmium, where is it? Right here. But it's fixed charge, okay? So, whew, that's a relief because we don't need to figure out what the charge is. We already know it's positive two. So we don't need to use Roman numerals. We can just name it now. Cadmium nitride. Uh, and do not use a Roman numeral for fixed charge, only for variable charge, okay? Only for variable charge. I should have... Put that over on the side there. But. So that was just to, to keep, you, keep you on your toes there. Make sure that you only use the Roman numeral when it's variable charge. Don't use it when it's fixed charge. Cadmium is fixed charge right here. So we don't need the Roman numeral. So we just write cadmium nitride. Okay.
And that was the end. This is always a long lecture, this one. So thanks for hanging in there. Uh, and this will uh, finish up the naming of binary ionic compounds. We still have more naming of ionic compounds to go in the next uh, lecture and acids. So I'll see you on that lecture.